ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय the living being entity stepping the body and mind to be the self considers some people to be his kinsmen to others to be outsiders because of this misconception he suffers indeed the determination of such concocted material ideas is the cause of suffering and so called happiness in the material world the conditioned soul thus situated must take birth in different spaces and work in various types of consciousness thus creating new body this continued material life is called samsara but that limitation foolishness and anxiety are due to such material conditions that we sometimes come to a proper understanding and sometimes fall again to a wrong conception of life text 27 atra udahati nam ithasam puratanam In this regard, an example is given from an old history. This involves a discourse between the Amraj and a friend of a dead person. Please hear it attentively. Perfect by Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. The word Itihasam Puratama means an old history. The Puranas are not chronically recorded, but the incidents mentioned in the Puranas are actual histories of bygone ages. Srimad Bhagavatam is the Mahapurana, the essence of all the Puranas. The Mayavadi scholars do not accept the Puranas, but Srila Madhvacharya and all other authorities accept them as the authoritative histories of the world. ओम ज्ञानम दास्यानम जनाशवक्षिणन्मिता तस्मा श्रीगुर नम श्रीचैता मनोभ्यस्ता कदम ददाति स्वापदीता हे कृष्णा कर्णा सिंधु दीनबंधो जगत्पते उपेशा गोपिका कांता राधा कांता नमोस्तुते तप्ता कांचना गौरांगी राधे रुद्रामेश्वरी ऋषभानु सुते देवी कनमामि हरि प्रिय जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैता गदाधर शिवाशे गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम हरे हरे एष आत्म विपार्यास यदिंग लिंग भावना एष प्रिया प्रिय योगो वियोग कर्म संस्कृति सो एट दिस पॉइंट इन द श्रीमद् भागवतम Hiranya Kashipu the king of the demons is speaking to his sister-in-law and his nephews and nieces and his mother his mother and the children they were all lamenting why were they lamenting because his brother was killed his brother was killed by Vishnu so Hiranya Kashipu so they were all lamenting So here we see the Hiranya Kashipu is speaking very first class philosophy. He was a great diplomat. He knew exactly what to speak at the right time. <laughs> so because his relatives were all lamenting, Hiranya Kashipu is giving very wonderful philosophy. He says, in his bewildered state, the living entity accepts the body and the mind to be self. So that is a fact. Just like. when the man is in, intoxicated when a man is intoxicated he speaks all nonsense isn't it and 
he, 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 all nonsense, nonsensical ideas come into his mind. So similarly when one is bewildered, he thinks the body and the mind represent his real identity. Therefore, he only wishes to execute those activities by which the body may get sense pleasure and the desires and aspirations of the mind may be realized. Further, Hiranyakashipu says, some people he considers to be his kinsmen and others to be outsiders. Just like on the bodily concept of life, we say, this wife, my family, they are mine. Others I don't care. The Hindus may think, we only care for the Hindus, the other communities, we don't care. So we identify somebody who may be born from the same womb as my mother to be my brother, sister, children, and everyone else, they can go to hell. That is, you see, the bodily concept of life. A devotee, whoever, is not the bodily concept of life, and hence, he considers the entire creation of the Lord to be his family. As Krishna says, Aham Vija Pradapita, I am the seed-giving father of all living entities. Prahlad Maharaj's father, Hirani Kashipu, was instructing Prahlad's teachers to train my son up in diplomacy. Diplomacy means this for divide and rule. He's your friend, he's your enemy. But Prahlad Maharaj, when he heard that this was his father's desire, he said, I'm not interested in this diplomatic land knowledge of friends and enemies because for me, everybody is my friend. So that is the vision of one who is not in a bewildered state. Everybody actually is my friend. Therefore, a transcendentalist is the well-wisher of everyone. Now, Hyane Kashipu is further saying, that the bewildered living entity, because of his misconception, he suffers. How does he suffer? One day you are happy, the other day you are lamenting. Isn't that what material life is? When you get your material desires satisfied, because your material desires are on the basis of body and mind identification, you manifest jubilation. Just like in Maharashtra now, the Shiv Sena and BJP, the one day election. So there's a big rally, crackers, everything, all pictures, smiling. But tomorrow if they were to lose the next election, then the same face will become sad. Last time, five years ago, the other party won the election, so they were happy and they were crying. Today somebody else is smiling and somebody else is crying. So this is because of the result of body identification. And this body identification is the cause of all happiness and all distress. Even when it comes to spiritual life, sometimes you find the devotees are happy, sometimes you find the devotees are sad. So, if you analyze, you will see that one who is happy He's not happy because he's got some aspirations realized or he has got some special recognition, but he's happy because some of the other, he's got attached to the holy name, to the process of Sharanam Kirtanam and the instruction of Guru Sadhu Shastra, and hence he knows how the Lord is the ultimate controller and everything is moving under the direction of the Lord. So, once you get off the bodily platform, and we endeavor to get attached to the process of devotional service, that's when one really becomes jubilant. That is why in the Bhagavad Gita 18th chapter, Krishna says, Rama Bhuta Prasanatana Sochati Nakanshati, that one who is spiritually situated, he is always joyful. He doesn't lament, he doesn't hanker. These are the two diseases or two symptoms of material existence. Everybody is hankering and lamenting. Everybody is full of fear. Even the birds, the birds are eating. But the moment they eat, they're looking in the back. Have you seen that? Why are they looking in the back? Fear. 
Prabhupada said they are looking. One bite they are eating, they are worried. Oh, somebody else may not come and take away this. So they have fear. They eat what? They have fear. Somebody else may not come and attack. So that is material life. Constant anxiety. That is why Govinda Das Kavira says, Baja Hure Manashi Nanda Nandana Abhaya Charna Ravinda Dev. My dear mind, you have so much fear and anxiety. And all this fear and anxiety will stay with you as long as you do not take shelter of the son of Maharaj Nanda. And once you take shelter of the son of Maharaj Nanda, then you'll become Abhaya Charna Ravinda Dev. Abhaya. Then you'll become fearless. So Hirane Kashyapu is saying how the living entity has to take birth in different species and thus he creates new bodies. How do you create new bodies? By taking on birth in different species of life. So Hirane Kashyapu is actually, he has mentioned many, many points, uh, but we don't have the time to discuss all the points. But the central point of all the points is the fact the one who is on the body identification, he identifies with the extensions of the body, his body, and the place of birth, etc. And he develops or establishes a false sense of happiness. Then after explaining this, Hirani Kashipu is now saying, I will tell you a story, a story of a very ancient king who died long, long ago. And where is the story to be found? In the Purana. Just so you can understand that this concept of bodily identification is there from the very beginning of creation. Because Hirani Kashipu, this was not some recent uh, advent. Hirani Kashipu appeared thousands and thousands of years ago. And he is relating the story from an incident that took place further thousands of years ago. You understand? Just like in the sixth canto of the Bhagavatam, Shukadeva Goswami reveals to Parikshit Maharaj that I will tell you a story that I have heard in the Puranas. And then he proceeds to describe the story of Ajahn. That that story was from the Purana. So the Puranas and Prabhupada makes a reference to this very important point in the purport, a not concoction. The Puranas are also, the Puranas are also known as supplementary Vedas. Therefore it is often said that there are five Vedas, not just four. The Puranas constitute the fifth Veda. And are the Puranas, the Amala Purana, or the smartless Purana is the, the Srimad Bhagavatam which Chaitanya described, Mahaprabhu described as a spotless Purana. Spotless Purana means, in the other Puranas, is also mentioned too, through the activity, etc. But in this Srimad Bhagavatam, there is no such reference. Dharma Prabhupada Kai Sata Dharma Nirma Saram Sata. This Srimad Bhagavatam rejects the concept of Dharma for the purpose of Artha Kama Moksha and instead propounds the highest truth. Sarve Kuntan Paro Dharma Yatra Bhaktiya Bhoksha Day. Now, that is how the self can be satisfied. Now, the story that Hirani Kashipu reveals is actually a very, very significant and important story. The story is of a king called Suyagya. Long, long ago, there was a king and his name was Suyagya. And he was the king of a place called Ushinara. So, this king had many wives. Now, in ancient times, kings did have more than one wife, and they were able to maintain all of them. So, there was no problem. Prabhupada explains that the woman's population is more than the male, so they have to be taken care of, and therefore this was permitted in our scriptures, but it's not permitted in the present day environment. So, King Suryagya, he died in a battle. He was fighting with his enemies. And when you're fighting, you get in a very angry mood, isn't it? 
Let's say Shakti of blood. Shakti of blood is so strong that even if you are a devotee, you develop anger. Just like in the Bhagavatam, you have the story of Dhruva Maharaj. Now Dhruva Maharaj was born as the son of King Uttanapal and he was a devotee from birth. But there was just a small incident. What was the small incident? Huh? No, but before that, a small child, as a small child, one day his father had two wives. One of his uh, wife or one of the son, Uttam, was sitting on the father's lap. So the other brother said, I should also go on my father's lap. So as he was trying to go up on his father's lap, his stepmother, to whom the father was very deeply attached, said, You cannot do that. You should pray to the Supreme Lord. And then if the Lord is merciful to you, you will take your birth from my womb. Then you can go and sit on your father's lap. And the father was henpecked. You know what henpecked? Henpecked means when you, when you become a slave of the wife. So the father was henpecked. He saw that his uh, wife is chastising this young boy. But of the affection for the wife, he could not say anything. But Dhruva Maharaj, he had Kshatriya blood in him. So he took these words, this chastisement, very, very seriously. And when Narada Muni appeared on the scene, and Narada Muni told him that your stepmother was just playing with you, joking. Don't take it seriously. Go and play. That's another time to look for God. God should only be searched for in old age. Just like all our relatives tell us. So, so go and play. Dhruva Maharaj was so aggrieved because of his Kshatriya blood that he could not tolerate it. So even if you are a devotee, if you have Kshatriya blood, you know, sometimes you, your ego gets a little hurt. Of course, this was the will of the providence. That should not be forgotten. So, um, this king, <clears throat> he was in a fighting with his enemies. And he was in a very, very angry mood. King Suryagya. And he had his, he was biting his uh, lips. And while biting his lips, he died. So when he died on the battlefield, all his wives came. And they all started lamenting that her husband is gone. Normally when a man dies, if he dies in the evening, the funeral must take place before sunrise. That is the Vedic system. And if he dies in the day, the funeral must take place before sunset. You should not keep the body for long. So, the wives, they, they now want the body to be buried. They all sat around the body and they were all crying. Look at my, look at our husband. He was so nice, so dear. He used to take care of us so nicely. Now he is gone. So now he is gone. They were all lamenting, crying. How will we live without our husband? <laughs> so they were delaying the funeral of the body because of their material lamentation. They were delaying the funeral of the body. And when you delay the funeral of the body, so anyway, so Prabhupada explains in the purpose how this was not good. So Yamraj, Yamraj came over there. Yamraj disguised himself as a young boy. Why did Yamraj disguise himself as a young boy? Because a young boy is not restricted anywhere. Just like the Kumaras, they were able to go everywhere. Isn't it? They were young boys. So nobody would stop the word Kumaras. They ultimately only got stopped. Uh, uh, and the Vaikuntha plan is, but they, otherwise they were, they had free access everywhere. A child, nobody bothers. So Yamra disguised himself as a small child and he came to the place where the king's wives and relatives were all lamenting, crying. And he said, Oh, look at these ladies. They 
they are lamenting for their departed husband, but have they not seen that everybody who takes birth has to die by the will of the providence? By the law of providence, everyone who takes birth has to die. If not today, tomorrow. We have all seen, no? all our relatives come and go. And these foolish people are just lamenting that well, our husband is gone. Just like Yudhishthira Maharaj was asked by Yamraj to describe what was the most amazing thing in history. And Yudhishthira Maharaj replied, at every moment everyone sees death taking place, but he thinks, I will not have to die. So Yamraj, disguised as a small boy, he started explaining to the wife, why are you lamenting? Don't you know that everyone who takes what dies? Don't you know that ultimately everyone is under the control of the Supreme Lord? So why are you lamenting? Do you think by your lamenting your dead husband will come back to life? Just like in the Western countries, um, there are uh, certain scientists who at one time held a view that when a, when a man dies, will freeze his body. And then, when you find a cure to the disease, then we'll operate the body and bring the life back. And 30 years ago or 40 years ago, I know when I was studying this, this was a big craze in America. America is a crazy country, you can virtually do anything and make money. So, so some man in Los California, he came up with a theory that when you die, you don't have to be cremated. So he, he made a big, just like you have cold storage units where you keep sabdi bhaji so it doesn't get spoiled. So he started a big cold storage plant in California in which they would keep dead bodies. And people would have to pay very high amount. You have to pay cold storage for 20, 30, 40 years in advance. So there are many millionaires in America. There is no shortage. So many millionaires, even Walt Disney, you heard of Walt Disney? He did this also. They would be, they would put their bodies in a frozen bed where they would lie frozen, get great comfort for a long time. And this man had given the theory, today you are dying because science hasn't found a cure. But one day science will find a cure to the disease that has killed you. So we we'll keep your body frozen. And when the scientists find the disease, find the cure for your disease, we'll take the body out, operate, and bring it back to life. So many people became victims of this bogus propaganda. Now it's died out, but at one time it had become a big craze amongst rich people actually. So people are thinking they'll come back to life. So people have so many foolish ideas about life and everybody wants to live on. Nobody wants to die, isn't it? Even if you're an old man suffering, you beg the doctor in the hospital, please, some of the other extend my life. So then Yamraj revealed this story. He said, how once upon a time this king. So Yamraj then gave this story to point out that actually the husband will never come back. Now your husband is dead. So then by the philosophical teaching of Yamraj, the wise of uh, the wives of this king, they agreed to let the husband be buried. And then Yamraj also revealed another story of two birds. Once there were two birds, pulling a bird, and there was a hunter, a very cruel hunter. What would he do? The cruel hunter would first throw grains, okay? Then the birds would come to eat the grains. And when the birds would be eating the grains, he would shoot the bird. Very cruel, isn't it? Like in India, I have seen, I was in Jaipur a few months ago. There's a place where people go and throw grains and all the birds come and eat. You know, many people do that seva. So, it is very cruel. They, somebody surrenders to you and then you butcher him. So, this country used to throw grains, the birds would come and he would then shoot them. So he would then throw his neck and catch them. So once there was a husband and wife and the husband
wants to grow his grain. And the wife came to eat the grains. And as the wife was eating the grains, the hunter threw his net and he trapped the wife. And the wife died. So the husband was left behind. And the husband was just lamenting. I have my young children in the nest. And these children have even heaven, their brains are so weak they can't even fly. Now who will take care of them? My wife, who I love so much, is now dead. And she's lying right in front of me. Who's going to take care of my children? The male bird was lamenting, lamenting, lamenting. So Yamra gave these stories to show how ultimately everything has been done by the will of the providence. And we all take our birth based on our karma for a certain period of time. And we must understand that this body is only a temporary companion. Actually, Hirani Kashipu has given a very nice example in this chapter. Hirani Kashipu gives the example of a restaurant or a place where you go to drink cold water. Just like in a restaurant, you may go and eat together. But then after you finish eating, you go on your path and the others go on their path, isn't it? Sometimes like in Vrindavan and all, there are many places where you get water. So you may, or sometimes people are giving langar. So you may go and take langar, drink water. But after drinking water, and when you're eating langar, you may be next to each other. But after you finish eating, you go on your path and the other person goes on his path. Just like you may be traveling by train. So when you travel by train, the other co-companions become like your friend, isn't it? Some of our devotees have preached in trains and all, that's good. But when the destination comes, they go their way, you go your way. So Hane Kashipu uses the example to point out that similarly we all come together and then we get separated by the will of the Lord. So what is there to lament? Just like all over the world, including our country, there is a tendency that we lament when the person dies, isn't it? Even in your country, isn't it? So even in England, everyone laments when somebody dies, huh? So they observe mourning, they wear black clothes, if you are a staunch Christian, you wear black to show no entertainment for me, someone just died, and so on. So, actually, as I said before, once it's a paradox, it's a real dilemma. What is the use of lamenting when a person has died? Rather, we should lament when he's alive and he's not remembering Radha and Krishna. That is the time to lament. Not when the person has died, dead. Just like Narasim Das Thakur explains, Hari Hari Bhifri Janma Gunainu, Manusha Janma Paya, Radha Krishna Bhajya, Janya Shunya, Pisha Thai. Pisha means poison. So Narasim Das Thakur says, that I have obtained a human form of body and I did not use this human form of body to worship Radha and Krishna. And because I did not use this body to worship Radha and Krishna, I have simply drunk poison uselessly. So, we should lament when our relatives are drinking poison. There is no point in lamenting when the person is dead. When you are dead, then you have to go to your next body. So our lamentation should be when we see people drinking poison. That is why Prahlad Maharaj, Prahlad Maharaj said, My dear Lord, I am not really worried about my own existence, nor am I interested in retiring to the mountains and to worship you in a secluded environment, nor am I interested in withdrawing myself to the forest. Rather, I am interested in staying where the people are, so that I can give them Krishna consciousness. Because the devotee laments when people are alive. We don't lament when people are dead. We lament when we see that people are alive. And instead of drinking Amrit, they are drinking Pisha. That is the time to lament. What is the use of lamenting when the person is dead? When the person is dead, is God. Prabhupada used to give a story of a man who was being drowned. So once somebody was being drowned, and so another man died in the ocean to save him. And 
he was only able to save his hat and coat. The body had sunk. So the man came back and he started showing off. See, I have saved the drowning man. See, this is his cap, this is his coat. The other man said, listen, you fool, the man's gone. All you've come back is with his coat and hat. So what good is that? So similarly, present society means just trying to save the coat and the hat. And you let your soul go to hell. You let your, your body, your real self go to hell. Just like Prabhupada gave an example of you polish the cage of a bird. You have a cage and you keep polishing that cage every day. Huh? Just like when people buy their new car, they polish their car. Even in the West, you know, on weekends in the West, what do people do? They won't go to High Krishna temple. They'll wash their car, polish their car all day. This is their principal sport, isn't it? This is a principal saver of the weekend. Polish your car, cut the grass, make sure your garden looks beautiful, fix up the nails in the house, so make sure when your friends come they say, oh, what a nice drawing room, you made a nice big room, <laughs> isn't it? So that's how mature life is. You're just anxious to be praised, how good you are, how intelligent you are, how smart you are. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati used to say, somebody says this and gets scared of him. <laughs> Be made of flatness. So, people are worried about just polishing the cage, making their house look nice, making the car look nice, making themselves look nice, just like they have. Uh, one of the biggest industries is the cosmetic and the makeup industry. Because when they go, they want to look more hands. When they're getting old, they do makeup. Get the, uh, get the cheeks plastered. If you're bald, you can put uh, now technologies there. Your hair can, you have very nice wigs, so you can't even see that you were bald. You can keep looking young for some time. So, so on. So many illegal, uh, so people try their best. So many illegal activities are going on, like selling our organs of the body to rich people, so that they can continue to survive and go on with this sense educative plan. So our lamentation is when the person is alive and when that person is misusing this human life instead of worshipping Radha Krishna, worshipping the mind and sense of So Hirani Kashipu is preaching to his bhavi, sister-in-law, mother and nephew and nieces. And he preached to him, them, by narrating two stories. One was the story of this king, uh, King Siyagya, who died. How his wives were crying so much, they would not let the body get buried. They said, no, we won't let him be buried. How can we live without you? And then he related the story, how the bird got killed, how the female bird got killed, then the male bird got killed. And ultimately the children were left on their own. So spiritual life means understanding that this body is a temporary companion. Spiritual life means understanding how Krishna is the supreme controller of everything. Not that Krishna only becomes a controller when you get what you want. And when you don't get what you want, somebody else is a controller. No. Krishna is the controller even when you don't get what you want. So, Krishna is a controller in all respects. And how? We all come together by a certain arrangement and then we all get separated. Just like the straws in the ocean. The straws in the ocean, by the waves of the ocean, they all brought together. And then by the waves of the ocean, they all get, what? They all get separated. So similarly, we come together in this body as my father, my mother, my wife, my brother, my sister, and so on, isn't it? So were they your mother and father, brother, sister in your previous life? Are they going to be your father, mother, brother, sister in your next life? No certainty. In the West, they have a faith called the Mormons, huh? Mormons? So the Mormons, they have a philosophy that if you get initiated in the Mormon faith, then they say, we guarantee you, after death, 
father, mother, husband, wife will be reunited in heaven. In heaven, John will again be with Mary. So many people fall a victim to that. <laughs> so they have a very big falling in, in the West because their philosophy is so conducive to sense enjoyment and bodily attachment. They say if you get initiated in our church and their initiations are all, all, are all private. In fact, in their temple room, you can't even go unless you are fully initiated. The temple room is, we have no secrets. Our temple room is open to everyone. Our mantras are open to everyone, isn't it? But they, in their faith, you can only go in if you are initiated member. And if you are initiated member, and if you follow their process, then after that you again get reunited, but in heaven. So they are increasing your bodily identification. Spiritual philosophy means getting out of bodily identification, breaking this bodily identification. But here is a concocted philosophy that presents how to increase the bodily identification. So instead of being a Krishna, you also think about your wife and so on. So many people fall a victim to that. So spiritual life means to understand how the body is temporary, the soul is eternal. Na jayate mete va karachen, na yambhuta bhavita vana bhuya, ajo nitya shashata yam prano, na hanyate hanyamane shri re. We see in the Srimad Bhagavatam, through a series of verses, the same theme is repeated, which we find in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Now in the seventh canto, Vyasadeva is giving the same philosophy which is already there in the second canto, the second chapter of the Gita. Isn't it? Again in the Bhagavatam there is the story of King Chitraketu. Then again you can go to the eleventh canto, ten canto, again you will find stories. Again in the subsequent canto there is the story of two birds in a tree. How the father and mother were madly in love with each other. All day the bird, the male bird would sing the glory of the female bird. And the female bird would say, oh, how sweet and wonderful you are, saying, praise the male bird, huh? So slowly, slowly they had many children. So one day, the father and mother went to the forest to bring some food for their children. And they left the children in the nest. So the children, when they saw the father and mother have gone to the forest to bring food, they came out of their nest and they started crawling, playing around the nest. They was a cruel hunter passing by and the cruel hunter saw these sweet birds walking around the nest and he threw a net at this bird and the children got trapped in the net. So when the father and mother came back with the food, they saw, oh, the beloved children right there in front of us but on the verge of death. So the mother started lamenting, see my beloved children right in front of me, there's nothing I can do. And lamenting, 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 she also fell in the hunter's net. And then the father said, see how foolish I was. When I had the opportunity to worship God, I did not. I wasted my time just praising the beauty of my wife. Now, my children are there in the hunter's net. My beloved wife is in the hunter's net. Now I am unable to rescue them. Because the moment I go to rescue them, the hunter will trap me also. And thinking, 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 he also fell in the hunter's net. So the Bhagavatam is giving this story right in the end. How this body is an illusory concept and a real self is the nature of the soul. Now, a philosophical question that can be presented at this point is, since this body is not a real self, then why do we care for this body? So why do we care for this body, since this body is not a real self? Why do we have prashat? Why do we take six, seven hours of rest? Why when I'm sick do I go to the doctor? Why when I'm cold do I cover my body? Why when it's hot do I use a fan? Isn't it? Why? I'm not this body! Why do I offer respect to another Vaishnava? Why do I bow down when I see another Prabhu? Why do I bow down when I see the spiritual master? Why do I do all this? You know, you're not this body. Mind is the number one enemy, the cause of distress. When you see that somebody gets something and you don't get, you get distressed. When somebody insults you, if somebody tells you the truth, 
you feel insulted. We are so used to flattery that when sometimes you have spoken the truth, you feel insulted. So then the mind troubles you. So mind is troubling us in so many ways. So that is Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, every living entity is struggling with the mind and six senses. Every living entity is struggling. So we are all struggling with the mind and six senses. Every second the mind is torturing us. The mind is like a butcher. It is merciless. It goes on smashing, smashing, smashing. Therefore Prabhupada says, Ignore the mind. If you want to make spiritual advancement, ignore the mind. Recognize that your mind is only cheating you. Therefore, take the instructions of the purified mind. Purified mind represents the mind of Vyasadeva as it comes down to the bona fide spiritual master. So, the mind is torturing us, the body is giving us so much trouble. Today you are healthy, you are smiling. Tomorrow you get some disease, you will become sad, isn't it? And ultimately the body is going to become old, and ultimately it is going to die. And when it dies, either it is going to become ashes, like the Hindus, they bury the body. So then it becomes, you get ashes. Or the Christians, they bury the body, it will be eaten by ants. And the Parsis, they throw the body in the well. When they throw the body in the well, the eagles come and eat it. And when the eagle eats it, they pass too. And when it pass too, it mixes in the dust and it becomes dust again. Therefore, Bible says, Thus thy art and thus thou shalt. So, this body is nothing but a source of constant trouble. Therefore, one who is intelligent doesn't listen to the mind, doesn't care for false ego, doesn't care for the material desires of the mind. All he cares for is Guru, Sadhu, and Shasta. Because he knows this is the path to salvation, this is the path to happiness. And yet the other path is just going to change him up. Change him up means it's just going to cheat him. Just like you give someone 100 rupees and he gives back 20 rupees. So you think you've got 100 rupees changed back, but actually you don't count it, you put it in your pocket. So that is called change up in English. So, because the mind is just changing us up at every minute. The mind is just making us believe, yes, you have the solution, but we don't have the solution. The solution is there, and we must faith, have a faith in the instructions of Guru and Krishna. That is why it is said, one of the unflinching faith in the words of Guru and Krishna, the purpose of the Vedas is revealed. And one who doesn't have faith, he may be a scholar, he may be a very sweet singer, he may be very learned, very rich, very poor, but he will not be able to develop Krishna faith. So, we have to Again, all other bodily concepts, we have to stop identifying with the mind and the senses, and the only process is if we execute the process of devotional service with full faith, and if we execute from the process of devotional service with full faith in Guru and Krishna, then we will be able to make spiritual advancement. Otherwise, we may hang around as devotees, but you are not making any advancement. And our goal should be to make advancement. We should be hungry for bhakti. We should be hungry for Krishna Prema. We should be hungry for devotional service. Just like when you are hungry, you force yourself to find food, isn't it? When you are hungry, you go everywhere and you find food. When you are thirsty, you force yourself and fight with water. So we should be hungry and thirsty for Seva. We should be hungry and thirsty for the Holy Name. We should be hungry and thirsty for the scriptural uh, instruction. And if you are hungry and thirsty, which is manifested by our enthusiasm, you may be hungry and thirsty, but it can be seen, and it is seen by your enthusiasm to serve. Because if you are hungry and thirsty, then you will be enthusiastic. And if you are not hungry and thirsty, then you will be complacent. Enthusiastic means you think there is a war going on, war with Maya. You don't have one minute to waste. Hence, you want to use everything, and only those activities which will help you to make spiritual advancement and stay away from those activities which will take you away from spiritual advancement. So, Hiranyakashipu is acting as a philosopher, Hiranyakashipu is instructing his sister-in-law, mother and nephews and nieces, don't cry because your husband has died, 
Don't cry because your son has died. Don't cry because your father has died. After all, we all have to die one day or the other. Hare Krishna. Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Hare